Hello everyone. Thank you for joining me today for our continuing summer study class sessions. We will begin this morning's session with chanting of the Junirai. It will be found on page 49 of the service book. And unfortunately it is not on the OCBC um, website. It's one of the one of the chants that's not included. So you'll need to have have the book for it with you. Uh, the Junirai is uh, the, the title means the 12 verses of reverence and in Japanese Juni means 12 so that's why it's called that. It um, is an ancient chant. It was written over 2,000 years ago during the time of Nagarjuna who's one of our, our seven masters and um, it was translated into Chinese, which is the version that we chant today. The, the melody is also extremely old. I don't know if it is also 2,000 years old, but it is an ancient melody. So those kinds of connections I find always very interesting. Um, through, uh, in verses 11, 2 to, through 11, there is a repeated verse which is Koga Chorai Nida Son, which means I venerate the Buddha with my head touching the ground, which is the most reverential way of bowing. So it is uh, basically showing deep respect for the teachings and for the Buddha. Just one note of um, caution or attention. The last verse, the melody changes considerably. So there is um, some musical notations in the service book that uh, I would encourage you to follow very carefully. And with that, we will begin. Naman Dabutsu, Naman Dabuts, Naman Dabuts, Naman Dabuts, Naman Dabuts. Keshu Shama Tagyo Nyozobu Yomoku Jo Nyaku Shorenge Koga Chorai Nida Son Menzen Enjo Nyomangat Iko Yu Nyosen Nichigat Shoyo ten kuku shira Koga chorai mida son Kanon chodai kan chiu jiu Shu ju meu soho shogon Nobu kuge do ma keu man Koga chorai mida son 
無微無苦高症状、修徳家受け入国、小さり役徳自在、小が将来乱損、十歩妙門菩薩衆、無料書魔女三段、衣装修女官力自由、古賀朝来未出損、本大法検知書家、全文書女目う大座、大膝女女女仙の、古賀朝来未出損、実法将来勝負し、権限人図しあんだ、戦後尊厳上苦行、古賀将来乱損、小雨無常無我と、役女水岩伝よろ、一周説法無明寺、古賀朝来乱損、非尊不専無悪女、役無女人悪道夫、死ゆ人死神教非尊、古賀朝来未出損、非尊無量法勉強、無宇少修悪知識、王女不退死亡大、古賀朝来未出損、眼線非損苦毒寺、修善無変、了解水、諸逆善言、諸宇宙、
Na mandabuts, na mandabuts, na mandabuts, na mandabuts, na mandabuts. Thank you for joining me in chanting today. Hello again, everyone. Uh, now we will continue with the study class portion of today's session. And I'm going to do a screen share with all of you. So here's, here's my theme today, Uncovering Jewels with Ken Tanaka. Um, some of you may be familiar with Ken Tanaka. He is um, oh dear, how do I get to the next oh, little technical glitches here. Um, he is uh, a very uh, noted scholar and author of Shin Buddhism. Some of you may remember having seen him as a guest speaker at OCBC on occasion. But he's come out with a a new book called Jewels, an introduction to American Buddhism for youth, scouts, and the young at heart, with a bit of humor. Um, Dr. Tanaka um, appeared on July 25th in Hawaii as part of their Buddhist Study Center series, and he um, gave talks, and the title of which was Passing the Torch to the Next Generation, Lessons I Learned from the Book, Jewels, an Introduction to American Buddhism for Young Scouts and the Young at Heart. So this is part of the Bloom Futaba Memorial Series, and um, he, did, he was on for, I think, close to four hours. It was, it was a very long session. So. Um, Anyway, to continue, sorry, with his book. This is the way the book looks. It just was released, and he is offering this book to all the temples in the BCA, free, um, six copies. Um, if you wish to purchase this book, it's $6, and um, you go to the BDK which is a Bukyo Dendo Kyokai um, book set, uh, website, and you can purchase this book, and they, and they, they they'll send it to you. Um, I think that um, this is a, an excellent book, and uh, and I would like to introduce you, it to you today. So he starts off at the very beginning in his preface with this cartoon. And um, he um, says this about the cartoon. As you can see, there's somebody that says, Jesus is coming. And the monk, Buddhist monk says, Buddha here now. And so he says, this symbolizes for me the coming of age of Buddhism as an American religion. This Buddhist is proudly, and even in a, challenging manner expressing Buddhist teaching on an equal footing with Christian teachings. So according to Dr. Tanaka's research, he estimates that today there are over 30 million people or one-tenth of the American population who are either Buddhist, Buddhist sympathizers, or have been very strongly influenced by Buddhism. He'll, he, if you read the book, he'll give you, kind of break out the details of, of those three different groups. Um, he says that Buddhism wasn't always so accepted, and he related stories of growing up in California in the 1960s. And I thoroughly related to how uncomfortable he had been reciting the Pledge of Allegiance when it came to the part One Nation Under God. And he talks about some of the strategies he used to kind of deal with that. But he also says, today things are very different. Buddhism is more well known, and he contends that it has become an American religion. 
which I agree with. With this book, Dr. Tanaka wanted to reach Buddhist youth because despite the growth of Buddhism in America, there is, this is still a predominantly Christian society. And there are still many challenges for young Buddhists to find a place in American society. But he says it's happening in many places and in many different ways, but it is indeed happening. I think Dr. Tanaka has two main aims in writing his book. One is, is to explain Buddhism to young people in an easily understandable way. And secondly, to explain how Buddhism is now an American religion. For the first reason, Dr. Tanaka tried to find common ground among the many denominations of Buddhism by focusing on the early Buddhist teachings before the formation of denominations. By doing so, he presents a set of teachings and practices that are common to all the traditions. In that regard, um, we really can't say that Dr. Tanaka's book is Shin Buddhist specific, but it's a good place to start on the Buddhist path and a good place for anyone who's new to Buddhism. Um, I would categorize this book as something we would call general Buddhism. Very similar to his other book, Ocean, which has been around for quite some time. Um, it also uh, highlights kind of the basics of the Buddhist tradition. As for the second reason, he says that for the first time in 2,600 years of Buddhist history, all the major Buddhist denominations in the world today are coexisting in many of the largest American cities, which is kind of an interesting statistic. Dr. Tanaka notes that Los Angeles is home to the most number of Buddhist denominations and sects in the entire world. And many of these same sects can be found throughout the United States. And I'll explain it in a, in a little while how all of that happened. So first of all, um, with regard to providing youths um, with an easily understandable explanation of Buddhism, um, Dr. Tanaka discusses the following teachings. He talks about the life of Shakyamuni Buddha, the Four Noble Truths, Karma, the Eightfold Path, and the Four Marks of Existence. These are all kind of basic aspects of, of all Buddhism. So as again, like I said, it's a very good place to start. So another teaching that comes from the name of the book, which I'd like to focus on for just a little bit. Oops. So the title of the book is Jewels and refers to three different Buddhist ideas, which he gives um, some attention to. And they are uh, the three treasures, which are sometimes called the three jewels, um, the Buddha, Dharma, and the Sangha. And we all know about that. When we do the three treasures, um, we always um, give reverence to, to these three aspects of Buddhism. So we're very familiar with that. The second way that he talks about jewels is he introduces um, us to the idea of Indra's net, which I think many of, of us are familiar with as well. Um, it's basically the teaching of our interconnection to everything in existence, and that each of us is a unique and precious jewel. Every intersection of the net is, represents one of us, and we have many facets, which is true, metaphorically and, and uh, literally. 
and the, the, there's a light that it, it gets emitted from each of us. So the light from each of these jewels gets emitted out and is reflected back to all the other jewels and everyone else's jewels. Um, the light is reflected back onto us so that we are all connected in this very complex and complete web of connection. So this is kind of on the outside, you know, sort of our connection. But then he talks about jewels in the third manner, the jewel that is within, and this idea that we have in Buddhism of Buddha nature. Each of us has within us the seed of Buddhahood that must be discovered through the teachings. So I, I like the way that he used um, the idea of jewels in those three different ways. Okay, so let's, let's move on. The part of the book that I personally found most interesting and what I want to spend the rest of my time talking about is um, Dr. Tanaka's discussion of American Buddhism and why and how it is now an important addition to the American religious landscape. Buddhism's earliest entrance into America was probably around 1844 among East Coast intellectuals such as Henry David Thoreau, Walt Whitman, and Ralph Waldo Emerson and their transcendentalist movement. So these are very, three very serious looking men. Uh, there are others, other intellectuals that um, he talks about in his book who embraced uh, Buddhist ideas and were very interested in Buddhism as far back as the 1850s. Um, this interest came originally came from Europe. It didn't come from Asia at that point. Um, that Europe had been, um, intellectuals in Europe had been studying Buddhism for um, many years before that. And then it, it kind of arrived in America in, in the mid 19th century. Yes. So a significant occurrence that happened in 1883 was something called the World Parliament of Religions um, in Chicago. And it was in conjunction with something called the World Columbian Ex Exhibition. Um, this was a very significant exhibition. People from all over the world came. Uh, this, this was made famous in several books. Um, and uh, recently in the series about Edison and uh, Westinghouse, there was, it was all about the, uh, the electricity wars. And this exposition had been lighted by, by light bulbs supplied by Westinghouse. But that, that's something that's <laughs> an aside to the World Parliament of Religions. So at this World Parliament, um, which again took place in 1893. Um, there were representatives from several Asian Buddhist traditions, um, and they were able to uh, present their ideas or their thoughts about Buddhism to a very wide American audience for really for the first time. Interestingly, among the participants was a very young D.T. Suzuki from the Soto Zen School of Japan, who would have a very significant impact on American Buddhism going forward. So, um, so these were the intellectuals or, you know, people who had kind of a, a philosophical interest in Buddhism. So now I want to contrast that with um, what he calls a living Buddhist tradition, which came to the West Coast with the Chinese and Japanese immigrants at the end of the 19th century. Uh, while Chinese Buddhists weren't really able to sustain a viable presence in large, in large part to discriminatory immigration laws, for some reason the Japanese were, were able to, to continue and to thrive. Um, they built temples and churches, and part of the reason was that they had support from 
the temples in Japan who sent ministers and priests to, to help the Japanese immigrant population. The other factor was that um, through the picture bride um, ability that the Issei's had of bringing women to America, many of the immigrants decided to stay and settle in the United States. And so thriving Japanese communities grew up and many times um, around the Buddhist temples. So they settled and raised families and thus established these temples. So up until the end of World War II, Japanese Buddhism, and more specifically Shin, was the dominant school of Buddhism for the first half of the 20th century, which is not to say that there were also um, other forms of, of Buddhism. There's Nichiren was here, uh, there were Zen schools, there was um, Koyasan with, um, with some of their temples, but Shin Buddhism was by far the most dominant. So, and, and so because of uh, very restrictive immigration laws, pretty much the only Asians that were in the United States were primarily Chinese, Japanese. There were probably some Filipinos, particularly in, the, in Hawaii, because after the Spanish-American War, um, Philippines became a US territory, so some immigration was allowed from that area. But I, I remember growing up um, as a child and mostly the Asians that I ever saw were either Chinese or Japanese. So this was the situation well into the 1960s, but then several factors dramatically altered the landscape of Buddhism in America and it marked a tremendous growth of Buddhism in the West. And this period is characterized by two concurrent movements. The, the first significant factor is, is what Dr. Tanaka calls the convert movement. Converts are those uh, who grew up Christian, Jewish, or with no religion, but who became Buddhist as adults by personal choice. There was among this group a greater emphasis on practice such as meditation and chanting. And among the first convert Buddhists um, were those associated with so-called beat generation of the 1950s. You know, think of Jack Kerouac and um, Allen Ginsberg. Later, as a result of GIs fighting in Korea and, and the Vietnam Wars, more Americans were exposed to various Asian cultures and their religions. So interest in the spiritual traditions of the East were of interest to many. And some of these um, people traveled to various Asian countries to encounter Buddhist teachings firsthand. Um, there was a whole movement, you know, as you recall, the Beatles went to India to work with the Maharishi Yogi. And there was definitely a, an attraction by many people to Eastern thought. So these people often um, had a focus on meditation and chanting and, and then many returned to establish centers. And they include uh, some of these people that are pictured here. Um, so these people went to places um, or they established places such as the Tibetan Naima Institute, the Shambhala International, the San Francisco Zen Center, and the Insight Meditation Society, which is quite huge. All of these practices focus on meditation. And today we are familiar with people like Pema Chodron, Jack Kornfield, Joseph Goldstein, Alan Watts, Sharon Salzberg, who are all pictured here, and many others. But they've, they've made um, Buddhism much more accessible. Soka Gakkai International is a relatively new Japanese religion closely associated with the Nichiren tradition, whose main practice is chanting the Lotus Sutra. And so they have been very successful by aggressively recruiting converts from minority communities and are today the largest and most diverse single organization of Buddhism in the United States.
interestingly enough. All right. So the, the second factor that changed the American Buddhist landscape occurred after the passage of something called the Heart Seller Act of 1965, which effectively opened up the US to immigration from Asia, which originally was not its intent. This was one of these unintended consequences. Heart Seller was originally formulated to attract people from Eastern Europe as um, a way to counteract um, commun communism from the Soviet Union. The Heart Seller Act wanted to allow Eastern Europeans to come uh, basically to leave their communist countries and come to the United States. But it also had the consequence of having lots of people from Asia. And so they began pouring in from Korea, Taiwan, Sri Lanka, Thailand, Vietnam, Cambodia, um, Laos, I guess Myanmar, and the rest of Asia. And it's, it's estimated that half a million came from Vietnam alone. And each of them brought their own Buddhist traditions. So there was a huge proliferation of people who came from a Buddhist, Buddhist tradition. And then, of course, we can't forget the tremendous impact of the Dalai Lama, who, uh, who and he's had an amazing um, effect in raising awareness of Buddhism in America. I mean, he has a very sympathetic uh, situation, having been having to flee his country and and uh, having his government in exile, and there are are many people that are fighting for uh, free Tibet. Interestingly, uh, his form of Buddhism, Tibetan Buddhism, is um, actually quite a small school, but he has been, has come to kind of be the face of Buddhism in, in the West and has given um, Buddhism a, a lot of notoriety. Besides the Dalai Lama, there are many celebra celebrities who openly profess their Buddhist affiliations, and they include people like Orlando Bloom, who you might remember from uh, the from the movies, Richard Gere, singer Tina Turner, musician Herbie Hancock, golfer Tiger Woods, as you know, his mother is Ty, and movie director Oliver Stone. Others associated with Buddhism include Steve Jobs, who was trained in Zen, former governor Jerry Brown actress Goldie Hawn and her daughter Kate Hudson. And of course we all know about Phil Jackson and his, he was called the Zen coach. He used a lot of ideas from Zen to motivate and uh, win championships. Today there are more forms and types of Buddhism available in the United States than ever before. So how do all these factors translate into an American Buddhism and what does this mean for Shin Buddhism? According to Dr. Tanaka, Buddhism is, in America has developed characteristics that differ from those in traditional Asian countries. This trend is especially strong in the convert Buddhist communities, you know, people who are interested um, in, in finding something be, besides what they were used to. Um, he mentioned several factors of, um, of what makes up an American Buddhist person, but I would like to highlight three characteristics that I think make Buddhism particularly attractive to Americans today. One is um, that people are seeking spirituality. Uh, many people, especially those under 40, are turning away from organized religions, um, us included, and seeking a more personalized practice-oriented spirituality. You know, today, uh, Dr. Tanaka mentions that a lot of people will say, I'm not religious, but I'm spiritual. And I think that, that that's um, a sign of our times. Traditional themes for Christianity have historically centered around themes like God, sin, faith, 
repentance, and morals. Today, more people are speaking in terms of connectedness, unity, peace, harmony, and centeredness. Buddhism stresses the importance of personal experience and comes to term with life's difficulties as a natural part of life. I think this spirituality also is reflected in the number of people who, who practice yoga, very personal. And I, I know from my yoga studio, uh, they have started to really emphasize the spiritual aspects of the practice. Meditation, number two, has become mainstream and is being practiced by more people than ever. And it seems to be that the answer for many people who are seeking is a, is a, a personal spiritual practice. So the, the amount of meditation and mindfulness that is currently in society today is mind-boggling. There are so many ways to to practice meditation and mindfulness, and it, it seems to be everywhere. Some of it has been secularized, but I think everyone agrees that Buddhism was one of the first to emphasize and practice a deep spiritual meditation and mindfulness practice. And then the last aspect that I think uh, is characteristic of American Buddhism is this idea that it's scientific. Um, Buddhism tends not to have any conflicts with modern discoveries, the way we look at the world. Um, it's, uh, it's not the way we view the world. We don't, we don't have um, tremendous creation um, stories and um, and it is non-theistic. It's deeply spiritual, but uh, we do not have a God per se. We, we emphasize Amida in Shin, and sometimes we talk about Amida in terms of um, power beyond the self, reality. There's a lot of ways that we characterize it. So one of the things that's happened to Buddhism is that some of the mystical and... Uh, mythical aspects have have been downplayed which appeals to many americans so i'd have to say that shin buddhism fits right into what today's spiritual seeker is looking for and has a few additional aspects that recommends it one, uh, we are the oldest and longest established Buddhist institution in America, and we offer an authentic practice. We are thoroughly American, I think, in part because we've been here so long. We are now into our fifth and sixth generations of our original immigrant population, but we are welcoming everyone today. The other thing that I think is um, a a definite plus for us is that we are a lay and family oriented practice. It's for people who have everyday lives and jobs and concerns with family and, um, and we offer a very sustainable everyday practice because of that. And lastly, I think we have a very simple practice, which doesn't mean that it's superficial. Um, we say the Nembutsu, we bow, we chant, we listen to the Dharma. Monpo, which is the Japanese word for deep listening, is an important aspect. And all of it serves um, for us to, to find a deep spiritual connection with, with all things, all people, with all existence, and to come to terms with who we really are. That, as Dr. Haneda says constantly, Buddhism is nothing if it, is, if it isn't self-examination. And that's something that we try to emphasize. So in that regard, Shin offers a path of profound depth and authenticity. So with that, I would like to say that we will be among the Buddhist traditions who can offer a spiritual path 
to a fulfilling and meaningful life. I know it certainly has provided that for me and hopefully it has for all of you. Please join me in Gasho. Namo Amidabutsu. Namo Amidabutsu. Namo Amidabutsu. Namo Amidabutsu. Namo Amidabutsu. Namo Amidabutsu. And thank you for sharing today or part of your day with me. And I hope that you gain something from this class. Please take care and stay safe. Thank you.